Hasta que nos saludamos. Buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, gracias por estar ahí presentes. Eh, bueno, damos comienzo entonces a una nueva edición de este ciclo mensual de, de, de seminarios de Llama. Ya es la tercera edición. Eh, bueno, como la mayoría sabe, supongo, eh, Llama es un proyecto argentino-brasileño, brasileño-argentino, para instalar un radiotelescopio que operará en rango de longitudes de onda milimétricas y submilimétricas y que se han instalado en el norte de nuestro país, más precisamente en la provincia de Salta. Eh, bueno, este proyecto inició oficialmente hace aproximadamente unos 10 años, eh, ha pasado por algunos altibajos, pero bueno, afortunadamente creemos que se ha encaminado y tenemos esperanzas concretas de que, de que pronto sea realidad. Y bueno, en virtud de esa concreción es que decidimos realizar este ciclo de seminarios eh, donde investigadores de distintas áreas e ingenieros también nos cuenten sus trabajos y sus experiencias que serán útiles para llama, como explicamos en las ediciones anteriores, eh, van a ser tres charlas. La primera es de 40 minutos y, bueno, él o la disertante es un investigador, investigadora senior de este proyecto que nos va a contar de sus experiencias en este tipo de instrumentos, eh, como es el, el, no, el, no en el caso de hoy, no, no va a ser relacionado con el proyecto, pero sí nos van a contar su, su experiencia, como, como va a ser en el caso de hoy. Y las otras dos charlas serán de 20 minutos, que serán charlas de ciencias y los, y los disertantes, las disertantes nos contarán de sus trabajos y cómo un instrumento como, como llama puede eh, ayudar en el desarrollo de, de los mismos, ¿bien? Eh, bueno, como les decía, eh, el primer, el primer, eh, la primera charla va a ser una charla de 40 minutos. Nuestro disertante va a ser el, el doctor Lars Niemann. Eh, voy a hacer una presentación de, de, de Lars. Eh, bueno, el doctor Lars Niemann obtuvo su doctorado en 1985 en el Onsala Space Observatory. Eh, por favor, Lars, eh, si después nos equivocamos en algo, aclararnos. Eh, en 1989 se unió al European Southern Observatory, a la ESO, para ponerse a cargo de las operaciones del radiotelescopio CEST el Swedish ESO Submillimeter Telescope en, en la silla. Del 95 al 2000 estuvo involucrado en la búsqueda y testeo de sitios para el proyecto LSA, el Large Southern Array, que después fue uno de los precursores de, de ALMA. Y a partir de 2000 se hizo responsable por la parte europea de la caracterización de sitios para ALMA. Desde el 2002 participó en la puesta en marcha del radiotelescopio APEX y en el 2003 fue designado como el primer director de sitio, el Station Manager. Se unió al proyecto ALMA en 2007 y fue designado como director de las operaciones de ciencia durante la construcción y los primeros años de operación del instrumento. Posteriormente, en 2018, volvió a Apex como Station Manager para las actualizaciones de infraestructura e instrumentación que tuvo el telescopio. En lo que respecta a bueno, áreas de investigación, es difícil hacer un, un, un raconto de, su, de, su, de su, sus antecedentes, ¿no? Basta con poner su nombre en el, en el ADS y uno encuentra más de 200 citas bibliográficas. Sus temas de investigación eh, son envolturas en los alrededores de estrellas evolucionadas, formación estelar, distribución del gas molecular en la galaxia y, bueno, técnicas milimétricas y submilimétricas astronómicas. Eh, Lars va a dar su charla en... en eh, de, de, la, su charla va, consiste en, en la experiencia, la instalación y commissioning y operación de radiotelescopios a grandes altitudes, algo que va a ser de mucha utilidad para, para el proyecto Yama. Eh, Lars va a dar su charla en inglés, pero bueno, va a responder las, las preguntas en, en castellano. Así que, bueno, eh, Lars, when you're ready, the screen is yours. Ok, thank you. Let me see if I can. Ok. Ok, can you see it? Perfecto. Yes, can you see my cursor also? Yes, yes. Ok, perfecto. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. I must confess, I have had some difficulties with actually trying to organize this talk, and uh, it, it's kind of complicated to try to talk about your experience. So, uh, I think, as Nic Nicolas kindly introduced me, I just wanted to mention, since I've been operating and installing things for some time here in Chile, I will mainly talk about my experience uh, as the Apex station manager. So basically the Apex uh, from the installation of the antenna until the, the most recent upgrades. So I will start by giving a short introduction um, to Apex, what it consists of. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience in various aspects of uh, operating and uh, installing and commissioning teles the telescope and instruments and so on. And This is more like in bullet list. So I was trying to make some kind of brainstorm with myself what, what I think. So it's not very coherent, all these things. But please ask me questions and um, we'll see how we, how we proceed with this. So, okay. Uh, first of all, Apex. Well, as you know, Apex is a Vertex Alma prototype antenna. It's in operations in Chile at Chaknantor. 
uh, at an altitude of 5,100 meters. So uh, the telescope, the telescope was installed uh, in 2003. Uh, it took roughly nine months, basically, from the beginning of the installation until it was actually uh, standing there with the surface accuracy uh, determined by photog photogrammetry uh, measurements. Then the telescope commissioning started in 2004, including the first instruments, and this took one and a half year, much longer than what we had uh, expected because we ran into some, some problems with a lot of the, of the, of the equipment, actually. And operations started in formally in 2005, in, in August 2005. So the partnership of APEX is between the Max Planck Society, the ESO European Southern Observatory and Sweden. The current agreement ends in 2022. And the partner shares are the most recent ones, so it's 55% Max Planck, 32 ESO and 13 uh, uh, Onsala, Sweden. Chile has, of course, 10% of the observing time, since the telescope is located in Chile, and then the partners share the rest of the time according to, to their share. So, uh, as Nicolas mentioned, the telescope went through after 15 years, more or less, or ten, yeah, 15 years of, of uh, installation and operations. It was time to do uh, upgrades, and this was mainly triggered uh, by the new agreement. Uh, that started and also triggered by the fact that machining techniques for aluminium panels have improved a lot over the last 15 years. So it's actually possible now to get panels twice as good as the original panels. So the idea was basically to change the panels, the panel adjusters uh, for the new ones and then hopefully be able to set the surface to better than 10 microns RMS in order to do very high frequency observations. Uh, some things age with time like the quadrupod legs, the shutter mechanism, gears, etc. So they were also replaced during this period. And the subreflector itself also uh, was improved because with the new machining techniques man can actually get uh, subreflector sub surface to an accuracy of two microns RMS. And during this time also the support, the hexapod, the subreflector support was changed for a new one and also a new wobbler mechanism developed by Vertex was installed. So um, as you can see here in the pictures, it was necessary to remove, take off the main dish from the telescope in order to do the panel adjustment uh, uh, replacements, because particularly for the innermost panels, it was impossible to access them without actually moving the dish. So the dish was taken down in 2017, put on the ground on a support structure. And you can see here in this picture, um, the Vertex staff working on installing the panel and panel adjusters. So all this was hoped basically to be done by the end of the 2018 uh, summer shutdown. But in fact, uh, due to various uh, uh, problems, it was not possible to reach 10 microns. So this had to be continued a year later in 2019. And there actually it, it was possible to, to reach 10 microns surface accuracy. And then continued surface improvements was done in 2020 in March until the pandemic started. But this is clear that um, certainly all these complex uh, activities and, and results uh, takes much longer than what, than what one expects to do. So the final picture here shows the vertex of installing uh, the new, uh, the new um, hexapod and wobbler mechanism up in the position of the subreflector. And you can here see also the, the new quadrupod structure and the, and the panels. Oops, sorry. So here I just wanted to show you the final holography map that basically down here shows you a surface RMS of a little bit more than 10 microns. Uh, you can see from the map also very clearly the subreflector and the quadrupod structure. And uh, in the holography measurements you get diffraction uh, around the quadrupod legs which shows up in the maps. And these are things that actually we try to removed by software simulations of diffractions and it was sort of it was successful. Um, you can see some panels here that are masked out, they have to be replaced later and this is the hole for the optical pointing telescope. 
There's also diffraction rings with this holography method all around circular in the outermost panels, but they were removed through these kind of um, si simulations of diffraction. So with this method, it was actually possible to uh, set also the, the outermost panels to, to reasonably high accuracy. In this upgrade, we also got new SIS receivers. So in the Naismith A cabin, were installed all these uh, new SIS receivers, single pixel, basically covering uh, all the atmospheric windows available up to 650 gigahertz. So it includes 180, 230, 345, uh, 460 and 660 gigahertz. And all these receivers are sideband separation or dual sideband, uh, most of them with 8 gigahertz IF and two polarizations. And the idea was, of course, to have this done by 2018 in order to have a number of years to observe before the end of the agreement. But in fact, it's taken several years for some of them to get into the final acceptance and then final commissioning. They were used meanwhile, but um, it takes time to do these things. You can see here actually in the picture, the Naismith A cabin, some of the receivers sitting right next to the elevation axis. And here you can see the lifting of, uh, of the CPA 345 receiver uh, with the crane in the back of the, of the telescope going up to the platform and then into the Naismith cabin. For Apex, the Naismith B cabin is used for uh, uh, multiple pixel heterodyne receivers. So there is a seven pixel receiver at 350 and uh, seven pixel receivers at 690 and 810 gigahertz. Uh, these things are difficult to operate. It's actually very hard to get calibration, LO injection right to all these, uh, all these pixels. So uh, although they've actually produced quite a lot of data, in the end, it turns out that fast OTF mapping with single pixel receivers is also very efficient. And most of the large scale mapping done with Apex over the last years have basically been with, uh, with single pixel receivers and fast OT OTF mapping. The Cassegrain cabin is used for uh, bolometer arrays. So we have the original one, La Boca, 295 pixels at 350 gigahertz, which is the real workhorse of Apex. It produced a lot of papers. Um, it's now uh, decommissioned and replaced by the new receiver here, Con Concerto, which just recently was installed, which is also a bolometer two bolometer arrays with the Martin Puppet interferometer in front of it. So you can actually also get some spectral resolution coming out of this, particularly for uh, sub-millimeter galaxies at high redshift. And it's also Artemis, which has been on the telescope for a long time from Saclay. Uh, because of the higher bandwidth, IF bandwidth of 8 gigahertz, um, the IF system and also the, the back end, the spectrometer back end had to be replaced. So this is now eight gigahertz system with 65,000 spectral channels per four gigahertz. And this one was installed in 2019. Apex is part of uh, the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope and been doing these observations with the 230 gigahertz receiver since 2017 very successfully. And the EHT project also installed a hydrogen maser and the disk storage facilities uh, uh, at Apex. Maybe not so much instrumentation, but the data coming out of all this is stored at Apex. So Apex has an archive, but it's also transferred, data is also transferred by fiber to the ESO archive. And there the data is available to the community, although the different partners have different proprietary times. So uh, sometimes also for large data sets, particularly VLBI, uh, shipments are also done by, by disks. Um, because Apex always had very reflective main dish panels, um, it, has, it cannot point to the sun. It will burn the subreflector and will burn the quadrupod legs. So it has um, a strict sun avoidance of, of 30 degrees. Um, this made it necessary to have people up on the site uh, for observations during daytime whenever, whenever the sun was up which caused a lot of commuting and a lot of people, uh, staff people, um, having to be up on, on the high site. So uh, it was decided to try to do a remote operation setup also for daytime observing, so 24 hours observing uh, from the base camp in, in Sekitor. So in order to do this, I had to install, first of all, very good communication to the site and very reliable um, 
control and communication to, to the telescope. So a redundant microwave link was set up. You can see here it was actually upgraded to 850 megabits per second in, uh, in 2019. So you can see the two, two antennas up on the high site on the little hill next to the telescope. And this is down in the base camp. Um, we also had to improve the grounding and, uh, and lightning protection up at the high site because we have had several in incidents with lightning strikes going on up here. On top of this redundant microwave link that access the telescope through the high level software, there's also installed a 950 megahertz system that access the drive system of the telescope directly. So it's possible in case of a complete breakdown up at the high site uh, of the higher level system to actually go in and move the telescope uh, through this 950 megahertz system. And this has worked very well. It's been in operation, this remote uh, control system since 2017 without any major incidents. And this has made life much easier, of course. Um, this is not only for science operations, of course, it's also for engineering operations. So at the same time, it's installed a lot of monitoring systems and control systems for all the telescope, the instruments, cooling systems, but also for the infrastructure, including the generators, um, the microwave link, all kinds of things. And there's also installed the GPS systems for 90 minutes of operation of facility instruments, in particular the cryostats, because in case of power failure or whatever, it takes about an hour to drive up to the site so the engineers could come up in time to, to try to restart the generators in case of any problems. So here's a picture of the control room where you can see the science operations monitor port, the engineering operations monitor port. And typically there is an astronomer and an operator all the time, 24 hours per day, uh, taking data. And the astronomer can be either from the staff or from the partners that send out visiting astronomers to, to do the observations. Here is just an example of the engineering panel. So one can see here, um, basically the status of various things from the sub-reflector to the Naismith cabins, the cabin C, compressor platform and then powerhouse and all kinds of things. So one can see here the temperatures in the Naismith cabins, for instance. Here we are looking at cabin A where we can see the status of the Cal unit, we can see the status of, of one of the receivers. Uh, so for the telescope scheduling, I mean the whole idea of putting a telescope at 5000 meters is of course to use the uh, the, the very good weather to do high frequency observations. So APEX for historical reasons and from the beginning did block scheduling. So here you can see the schedule for uh, six months in 2020. Um, this was produced before the pandemic. So after the pandemic, the schedule didn't happen, but I'm sure it as an example anyway. So here you can see blocks of technical time in blue. You have ESO, ESO time in green. You have Swedish time on solar in yellow, Max Planck time and Chile time. And the idea was to have these blocks intervening so uh, each partner could have access at least to potentially high frequency time and then sharing uh, the, the worst time of the years for low frequency work. Uh, this was modified a little bit later on. Uh, I should maybe also say Apex has a three month shutdown every year due to the Altiplanic win uh, winter from December 20 to March 20 where also instrument uh, installations are done and telescope upgrades and so on. Uh, technical time uh, is inter interleaved here also. Technical time is used for holography, for uh, calibration purposes. But you also need to have uh, availability of high frequency time in the, in the technical time, particularly to work on the high frequency receivers, calibrations, etc. So some of the technical time is flexible. So basically the uh, uh, APEX staff can decide, okay, now we need to, to do, uh, we need to do this. For uh, the partners who usually have shorter blocks uh, of time, like a week or 10 days, if they are lucky, they can get very good weather during this period and then they will run out maybe of their high frequency projects. Uh, if that happens, they will try to run high frequency uh, projects from the other partners in order to actually use this good weather time and not be stuck with doing say band five observations when you have band nine weather. And then afterwards they have to uh, uh, figure out, you know, how much time they owe each other. And this has actually worked very well. So uh, for high frequency observations, 
um, I took out here a picture of the water vapor evolution during the first week of August, end of July, beginning of August. It was bad weather time. So the blue dots are the data and the red here is the prediction. But you can see how quickly you can change from 0.5 millimeter of water vapor to two millimeters. Uh, I already mentioned a way to deal with the share of high frequency time by block scheduling. Other projects, okay, like Alma is doing dynamic scheduling. So there it's no block scheduling. So it's the best project to observe is, is, uh, is selected by basically a software system. Um, so it observes the best project at any given time, depending on the condition. And it does not matter which partner it belongs to. And then one has to keep track uh, of the time of each partner in order to make sure that during each ALMA cycle, um, they, get, they get their fair share of the, of the correct share of, uh, of, of time. So um, this dynamic scheduling makes it more difficult for visitors from a partner to come in to do the observation. So one has to organize it in, in, in a slightly different way. Okay, let's see. Yeah, a bit of observing statistics. So time on sky for Apex for observations have increased gradually with the time. So in the beginning, we were running 12 hours, then 16 hours, and then 24 hours. Here we had the shutdown due to the telescope upgrade, so 2017 was a bit lower. And also we started with the remote operations uh, in 2017. And you can see that it does, not, it does not really increase the observing time on sky, but it certainly helps a lot with all kinds of uh, operations and commuting and not having so many staff members on, on, on the high site at any given time. Apex publications is typically around 70 per year. I only have uh, statistics until 2019, so I don't have it yet for, the, for 2020. Infrastructure. So on the high side, the power generation is done by three generators. And this is also gradually evolved. Originally it was two, but it turns out that if you really want to have a very reliable power generation using generators, you have one generator operating at any given time. The second generator is the, the hot backup, basically. So if something happens to the first, the other one kicks in. And the third one is usually a generator that's under maintenance or, um, or having other problems so that, that you need to fix. So up on the high side, we have containers. You can see some of them here for operations, lab, storage, kitchen, restroom. Uh, here is the installation of one of the containers done in 2005, I believe. And these two containers here, they are oxygenated. So the oxygen level is increased from 21 to typically 26, 27%, which helps quite a lot if you're working inside the container, particularly if you're controlling the telescope from, from there. You can also see it um, after snowstorms, we have to dig ourselves in basically in the, to the entrance to, to the container. So it's always good with good snow cleaning uh, and so on. Up on the high side, we also have the microwave link and the, and the holography transmitter. Uh, down in the base camp, uh, there are buildings. So it's offices and the control room. So you can see here, this is the control room. Here we have offices and labs. It's 18 dormitories. There is a sala multiple for meetings and gym and so on. And kitchen, dining room, storage, car maintenance. Sekitor also has three generators. Uh, it's down in San Pedro. It's about six kilometers from the center of San Pedro. Um, and in principle, one could connect to the, to the main power of San Pedro, but they only give five kilowatts per household and uh, we needed like 50. So we had to do use generators. There is a fuel filling station for vehicles and the water uh, that comes in used uh, in, in the bathrooms and, and other purposes comes from, from the San Pedro supply. Uh, in the last years, we had to do, install new fuel installations because of certification problems. So the base camp got a new diesel tank, a new vehicle filling station, automatic filling station for the generators, and up on the high side, we replaced the, uh, the diesel tank. So Apex is operated in Chile by in total 19 staff members and five contractors, plus also kitchen and, and cleaning. So the staff typically goes in turnos, as it's called a shift system. So they are eight days on site and then six days, six days uh, in rest at their home. 
And most of the staff live in Santiago, although some live in San Pedro and Calama and so on. And you can see the distribution of, of staff members here for uh, head science operations, four astronomers, six operators, and then for engineering, where positions basically are doubled because of this Turner system. So out of these uh, 24 pe people, there are typically 10 people on site uh, at, uh, at any given time, plus also visitors and people coming in from, from the partners. And the organization, well, it's obvious science operations. So the astronomers operators don't only observe, they also are responsible for the calibration plan, observing script and the observe determination of the observatory calibrations. They also participate in commissioning activities and in fact science operations is responsible for the holography measurements and also for char characterization of instruments and also data archiving and backups. And engineering operations is basically maintenance and fixing of problems of everything from telescope to instruments to containers to generators, vehicles, uh, everything. And they also support installation of instruments. And they have over the years been involved in a lot of upgrade pro projects, including holography system, replacement of chillers, a new optical pointing telescope, new calibration units, UPSs, etc. And then, of course, logistics is important. So there is one person taking care of that, particularly commuting accommodation services has its uh, challenges from time to time. OK, so that was APEX in a, uh, yeah, in a nutshell. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions about the APEX part. Or shall we take questions at the end? Now, mm. How many postdocs do you have in Earth? Um, in the APEX staff, they are all, uh, it's four astronomers. It used to be more, but uh, currently it's four astronomers and they are all staff members. So we don't have, at the, locally here in Chile at APEX operations, we don't have postdocs. On the other hand, the partners, Max Planck, uh, Chile, Sweden, ESO, they send a lot of students and postdocs to basically perform observation and learning, you know, how to, how, how to observe hands-on uh, with the telescope. And that's been very useful for them. And we have a lot of, lot of young people coming in to, to help with the observations. Lars, uh, are you currently using the tip tilt system for on off? Uh, at the subreflector. Yes, the subreflector has a new chopping mechanism. So this was provided by Vertex. And yes, this one is used a large part of the time. I also have a question, can I? Tenemos una pregunta, Felipe. Ah, bien, bien, Felipe. Uh, Lars, is there any prediction for including a polarimeter in there? Because I used Polka in the past and mm -hmm. it would be... I keep waiting if, to know if Polka will be back online at some point, but it no, would what? be nice to have a polarimeter for the southern sky. And yes, I, I agree. No, La Boca has been decommissioned. The, the place where it was located in the Cassegrain cabin has been uh, now used by this new concerto instrument. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know... Well, for um, Artemis, there is I no... Artemis, no, there is nothing. Um, concerto, I actually don't know. I, I doubt it, but it, I, I, I can find out. Okay, thank you. Yes. What, what is the fraction of time uh, in Apex uh, using it as a stand alone antenna compared to being part of a larger array? Well, I would say most of the time, you know, the Apex does not have a three millimeter receiver, so it does not take part in the GMBA VLBIs. It only takes part in EHT. And EHT so far has been on the order of a week, uh, a week per year or so, a week to 10 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, so it has not been used uh, in, in regular form uh, with Alma? Uh, as a... uh, no, no. And what about uh, uh, fiber optics in Chakmanto? Um, yes, so uh, Alma has a fiber optic connection that was installed a number of years ago to the outside world. 
So it basically follows the gas pipeline uh, to Kalama and then it connects into the Riona, uh, Riona system here in Chile. And then it goes on through the Santiago, Iso Santiago over to, to Iso Garching, basically following the same fiber setup as, uh, as the data from La Silla Paranal uh, transfer to, to the Iso archive in Garching. Yes, when I was in Chile, there was a project of, uh, of uh, continuing with the uh, uh, fiber optics uh, across the Andes to the Argentinian territory. Uh, Is that uh, stopped? I think it's probably still in the pipeline. Now, you know, for the last two years, I have not followed very closely what's going on there since I, since I retired. But I know, I, I know, I mean, I don't think it's stopped. I think it's probably still in the pipeline, but it might take some time to, to get it done. Okay, Manuel. One more question. What is the, the refraction of the time that you use for uh, concerto, the kids system? Is yeah, the kids system. Well, you know, it was just recently installed and commissioned, and uh, there is the first light picture that's been out in the press releases. So, um, um, so, so far it has not been used for regular observations. It was just, just recently installed. And I think there are still some things they have to do on it. So it will be used for the next years. And um, uh, I think each partners have promised to, um, to give some of their observing time away for, for concerto observations. Eh, disculpen, se me cortó. No sé si alguien tiene alguna pregunta. Manuel, creo que tiene alguna pregunta. Yeah, uh, thanks. Did, did you uh, did I understand understand correctly? Um, you, you mentioned some problems with the seven pixel uh, of, of LASMA and champs, uh, and and you are using you are not using the seven pixel receivers or? Yes, these are PI instruments by the Max Planck Institute. So. Uh, and they are using them from time to time. But what happens is if you have many pixels, it could suddenly happen that uh, one of them stopped working, for instance. And then you have to you know, take down and open up the whole cryostat and try to fix that, which is a time consuming procedure. The other thing is the calibration of each pixel. I mean, ideally each pixel should give exactly the same output, the same calibration, but they don't always do that. And there is also problems with the LO injection which can also cause these calibration offsets that you don't get the same LO power into each of the pixels. So overall, we did. overall you can overcome this. No, it's been a number of publications uh, uh, done both with LASMA and, and, and CHAMP Plus. But uh, it actually turns out now that you're getting very good, you know, single pixel receivers and we also developed the, the on the fly mapping technique to very fast on the fly map. So you can actually efficiently cover large areas of the sky with single pixels receivers as well. But okay. one just has to be aware with, uh, with uh, multiple pixels, you really have to keep track of the system. You really need to spend time on making sure that it's operating well and that the calibration is, is working and so on. Mm -hmm. Perfecto. Si no hay más preguntas. Eh... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, so I come now to the part of the, my experience where I had some problems organizing it. So I'm afraid it won't be so many pictures. It will be mainly uh, <laughs> bullet points. So uh, let me tell you, starting basically from the beginning, safety is the most important thing. Okay. You have to have safety plans. You have to have safety pro procedures in place before the installation even starts of the telescope. And this is essential because basically you don't want to have any incidents with people getting hurt or anything um, happening uh, uh, during the work. So uh, Apex has, of course, all the safety plans. They are on the web. So if you go to the Apex web pages under safety, you can actually download these documents. But uh, among the more important things to define is the maximum time spent daily on the high site for each staff member. So typically because of Turno systems, the first day people can stay maybe six hours, later on maybe eight hours. 
but that's something one, one has to see depending on, 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 on the conditions for, for Yama, for instance. Um, minimum number of staff at site at any given time. That's actually also important. I mean, typically one would say at least two people. And if something happens to one person, the other one can drive that person down or help. But the exception to this is if something happens with someone working in the telescope in the cabins. I mean, we had an uh, event where someone fainted in the Naismith B cabin. And one person cannot basically bring someone down from, from up uh, in the telescope down. You have to have at least two people, which means that anytime uh, there needs to be some work done in any of the instrument or, or Cassegrain or Naismith cabins at Apex, we have to have at least three people on, on the site. Use of oxygen. Uh, this is very important and it should be used actually uh, all the time by people being up there also in particular if you have more complex activities going on. Uh, for Alma it's compulsory for all staff to use oxygen when they're up, up on the site. For Apex it depends a little bit, it's not compulsory, it depends on person and activity, but it's of course strongly recommended. All the staff members must be trained in all aspects of the safety plan. And also of course each staff member is responsible for, for, the, for, for, the, for, for the safety. And this is really important and people have to be trained and people have to know this. Commuting is always an issue because you're driving up and down. So you need a good communication plan for what's going on during the commuting. So people can report in and people can people in the base camp can check basically what's, what's going on uh, with, the compute, uh, with the commuting. Um, recently, we also had to include a maximum total time spent for staff on mission. So these are staff from the partners coming. <laughs> for extended period to install instruments, commission instruments, even if they have longer observing runs, they should not work for more than 14 two weeks at a, at the time before taking a break. Because we had some uh, issues with staff basically showing fatigue symptoms and had been taken to the clinic. People had been observing a lot, spending night, staying up night, etc., and got really tired. So this is important. For emergencies, you need access to a clinic and ambulance. So I guess in San Antonio Los Cobres, you need to have an agreement with the clinic and so on. Um, the base camp of Yama is quite located at quite high altitude, I think at 3,600 meters, which is basically an altitude where people can, can get altitude sick. And in particular, if you have someone on the high site, uh, get being altitude sick, taking them down to, to the base camp might not be enough. Now, I believe the clinic, the clinic has one of these um, uh, high pressure chambers that people can basically try to recover in, or some other ways also producing a more high pressure uh, environment. But it's extremely important to know that the project has access to this on short notice in case of, in case of problems. And for emergencies, it's also one needs procedure what to do during inc incidents in uh, on site in the base camp commuting, whatever. This is very important. Uh, communications also between the base camp and uh, and the site and communications to vehicles as they are commuting is very important and preferably it should be redundant. So you have radius, but okay on the high site you will also have a microwave link. Um, and I don't know about the mobile telephone communication, if that's uh, at all, it's all working at, uh, on the way to the high site. You also, to the outside world, it's very useful to have a backup satellite telephone in case everything uh, goes down and, and you need to communicate, you know, to the outside world. Of course, bad weather procedure, procedures. It's good to have a lot of cameras um, in order to monitor stuff and systems at the high site, both inside the containers, the generator house, the telescope, uh, all the, all the, everything. And it's also good to, to have the staff at the base camp knowing more or less what activities are going on at, up at the high site. Um, vehicle maintenance is of course crucial. I mean, if a car, if you have an accident, somebody has an accident and it's caused by maintenance issues, who is responsible? So for Apex, we started in the beginning to have the cars maintained by the car dealers. And it turned out at that time in Chile, at least this was not very reliable. So um, 
we started to do it in-house with the, with the help of the mechanical technicians we have and so on. But then again, who certifies that the core is in, in shape to be driven up from, from the maintenance point of view. Uh, procedures for crane lifting activities, which is something we needed to include because we had one incident in 2018 with uh, an instrument being lifted by the crane uh, behind the telescope. Uh, and it basically fell down several meters into the ground. And it's clear, fortunately, nobody was hurt, but the receiver had some problems afterward and had to be shipped back. So uh, operations of this crane is very important and having clear procedures and also making sure that you have enough time to check that everything is, is, is working out and everything is prepared. And finally, for Safety, this is not for stuff, but this is rather for equipment. I mean, after a snowstorm, it might take time to get up to the site. Sometimes roads can be closed for a long time. So snow cleaning is, is an important part of, a, a part of this to make sure that uh, you have some kind of access to it. Security is simple. Okay, you need site protection, fences, whatever. Cameras and site monitoring is essential. And of course, the collaboration and agreement with the local police and fire brigade in, in in terms of incidents is essential. Okay, if we now come to installation and commissioning. So just in general, it's extremely important to have detailed plans for how to do this. Um, AIV plans, uh, assembly integration, verification, commissioning plans. And there should include timelines and plan the work basically down to a daily basis. So you would have plans and checklists for daily work that later on has to be reviewed. Of course, you always get delays, you always get complications, but in order to do this in an organized way, you, you have to have this, uh, this ready. It's also important that these plans are such that people don't get under stress because that's when incidents happen. So for instance, a crane lifting procedure, you should make sure that you have all the time you need to do this, not just the time window between other activities. <laughs> What we also done at the apex during summer shutdowns and these more complex active, complex upgrades, where there is both work on the telescope going on, there is also receiver installations going on. So one can actually try to do multiple activities. One can do it such thing that people sometimes, you have teams up working at night, you have teams up working in the daytime. And sometimes one can do this in parallel depending on, on the activities. So if one wants to do this to be efficient, it's extremely important to have organization done very well. And also make sure that the time windows available for the activities, say per day, uh, you don't have too many activities. It has to be planned in such a way that you don't get under too much stress. And also monitoring from lower altitude is important during this time to see where people are and what they are doing. And as I said before, I think everything takes two to three times longer than planned. I mean, this is for all things that, that can happen, for bad weather, for any kind of incidents, whatever. Things take much longer than you believe. Okay, coming to staff. Uh, well, I think, well, you already know, hiring of a site manager and project manager early is, is essential, and this has, to, this has to be done. Another thing is that at least at Apex, we had staff already when the telescope was installed because we had a number of staff coming from La Silla, both electrical engineers and mechanical technicians, etc. And a number of them were basically taking part in the assembly of the antenna. And this together with Vertex. And this is extremely important because afterwards you have to have people in the store for know the antenna inside out, mechanically, electrically, and, and everything. I mean, this in-house knowledge is, is essential. So technical training of local staff during the telescope installation is a must. And of course, documentation here is essential. You have to have the documentation of everything installed. Uh, then comes the question of what kind of knowledge do you need the local staff? Well, local staff, I mean the staff who are actually on site or in Salta or whatever, operating the telescope. So for Apex, the 24 people I was talking about basically know everything about operations and maintenance of installed equipment. They also participate in, as I said, in upgrade projects. Uh, and they do this, but they are not experts on the software because the software is coming 
is coming from Max Planck in Germany. Um, and they are also not experts on going into the cryostat, say, of, of receivers. So it's very important to have experts available to, who can come down, say, uh, to the site in case of real problems, both with the antenna or any type of instrumentation problem or whatever. And then, of course, outsourcing. One can do for kitchen cleaning and some, some maintenance. It's, it's actually a good method of, uh, of, of, of doing it. So, okay, assuming now that we have the telescope uh, on site, you need to commission it. And software is very important. I mean, this is all the software basically from the beginning to the end, including the telescope uh, drive system, including telescope control, instrument control, taking of data, so IEF system, backend spectrometers, and getting the data into an archive and then be able to analyze it. This has to be ready by the start of the telescope commissioning, basically, and go leading up to first light. So surface setting and holography, I will come back to this in the next slide. Then you have to do pointing. And there will be an optical pointing telescope and then also uh, radio pointing. So uh, there are a lot of things one can, one can talk about this, but optical pointing is good to characterize the telescope to start with. Um, before you have any receivers uh, getting into the telescope. Afterwards, Apex uses it actually as to set up the main pointing models, but then there are uh, offsets to each, receivers, each receiver. Um, you can also get the high level or high, uh, yeah, high level pointing terms coming out of the optical pointing because you have a lot of sources. Uh, since the optical pointing telescope is not at the bore site of the telescope itself, there are terms that it cannot check, which has to be done with the radio pointing. And for the radio pointing, it's always a problem with the, which pointing sources you have available. Band, I think band five and band nine will be the, the receivers on, on the telescope at the time of commissioning. So for both bands, there are planets. And then band five is easier because you have strong quasars, you have SIO masers. And you also have the HCN two to one line in carbon stars, which is bright enough to actually do pointing on these stars. Band nine is a completely different uh, problem. There you basically have planets. You have some uh, CO uh, emission lines from evolved stars that can be used. And there, is, there are a couple of H2O masers, but this is extremely tricky uh, to do. Focus, of course, one had to determine the focus. What took some time at Apex was to determine the said focus offset as function of the outside uh, temperature. Uh, that has to be, it's good to put that in as an automatic correction. Then, of course, you have the observing modes. I guess starting with on off is, uh, is essential, but raster maps and later on on the fly mapping, which is sort of another beast of complexity to, to do, but uh, it's a very powerful observing uh, method. As I mentioned, the apex wobbler comes from Vertex. I don't know what YAMA plans are for the wobbler, but that also takes some time to get this to work properly and to commission it. Um, one serious issue here, which usually happens during telescope work and telescope installations and uh, because of the drive system and the, um, and the um, um, how do you say, the installation and uh, the commissioning of the drive system, it's very easy for the telescope to get into quite violent oscillations from time to time. And this is not good, of course, for, for the equipment installed in the telescope. So one has to make sure also that all the electronics cabling connectors are mechanically very stable and very well done. Another issue which I will, yeah, which I can mention now is that uh, remember the Naismith cabin, the instruments there are pretty far from the azimuth axis. And that basically means if you get into oscillations or even uh, accelerations of the telescope, you get a lot of centrifugal force and all the equipment in uh, and the receivers in, in the Naismith cabins. So this is something that has to be taken into account. It has to be very stable, mechanically stable and, and well installed. Okay, holography, which is another beast. Um, you need basically an expert on holography setup, data analysis and map interpretation. There is nothing trivial about all this and man seems to have to learn uh, every time. For Apex, we got the original holography system from the sub-millimeter array from SMA. 
and their experts uh, basically came down to Apex to help with the first holography runs, together also with stuff from the IRAM uh, 30 meter telescope, who was also experts on, on, on doing these things. And it took some time actually to sort out um, this whole setup and actually to get reasonable maps out that can be used for, for surface setting. If you want to go to say 15, 20 microns, it's, uh, it takes some time, it's not dramatic, but for Apex going down to 10 microns, there was a lot of uh, um, effects coming in that you, you don't see if you don't go down to 10 microns. Then we have photogrammetry versus holography. So photogrammetry is usually done first and then surface set according to this. So this is basically taking high resolution pictures, lots of them with a digital camera of the main dish and then determining its, uh, its, its surface and then setting it according to that. You can usually get down, at least for Apex, we got down to 30, 35 microns uh, RMS using photogrammetry. However, the, uh, you get the shape of the dish to 30 microns, but the direction of the dish where it's pointing might not be correct because um, you don't go through the bore site of, of, of the telescope. So usually the first holography map that we've done with Apex after a phot photogrammetry based setting of the surface shows 50 to 60 microns and then one has to set the surface and take it from there. Uh, for Apex we have a slightly different setup than from JAMA. The main receiver is in the Cassegrain cabin and that can be switched in and used within five minutes or so. So if one night one needs to check with doing holography observations, it's, uh, it's easy to do. However, with the YAMA setup, where I guess you have the uh, receivers uh, in the subreflector, in the place of the subreflector, it takes some time to do this. So holography sessions, I guess, need to be planned uh, well in advance, and you also need to figure out when you actually need to do them. Um, for YAMA, you have the low elevation of the transmitter. I don't think it's much more than five degrees, perhaps, from uh, seen from the telescope, which means you will have ground reflections. This happened at Alma as well in the, in the base camp when the first holography was done. So here one needs to put a, a large aluminium sheet at the position of the ground reflections to, to uh, reflect the beam into the sky so you don't see uh, the reflection, but rather the sky. Of course, after holography, you need to confirm the surface accuracy, and this has to be done by high frequency measurements and, and beam maps. So basically using band nine. Um, and these are not always easy to do. You have to use uh, maybe the planets to do this. Um, Apex has actually used um, an H2O maser, a very bright H2O maser at 658 gigahertz to take beam maps and that has worked out very well. But of course these sources are variable and they might not be always be available. To set the surface itself is a lot of work actually. So the minimum you need is to have people going up in front of the telescope with the, with the surface adjustment tool. And of course with all the documentation necessary to know which screw to, to move how much. So a minimum team is two people in each in, in a man lift. So uh, one running the man lift and the other one uh, doing the surface adjustments. The problem with all this is that you have the quadrupod legs in, in the way and they are carbon fiber quadrupod legs. And if you hit them with the man lift, they most likely break. So the people uh, running the man lifts have to be very well trained. And also the man lifts need to be a good of good quality so you can actually maneuver them uh, accurately uh, in front of the telescope and around the quadrupod legs. So to speed up the surface setting, Apex typically lately has used uh, two teams at the same time with two man lifts, two people each. And uh, they typically operate uh, two hours and then of course they get cold and then they need rest and then we have two other teams coming up and then they shift like this. In this way it's been possible to set the surface of the antenna in, in about eight hours one day. Okay, receiver installations and commissionings. So software again is very important, we must never forget that. Tuning monitoring, also making sure they have atom automatic shutdown on the receivers in case of temperature rising in the cryostat. Again, you need to have detailed commissioning and acceptance plans and also very experienced people to do this. So for Apex, we have had typically two acceptances for each instrument. 
One is the pre-shipment acceptance, where basically the instrument delivery team um, makes all the measurements that's possible to do in the lab, which includes tuning range, uh, receiver temperature, sideband separation, and a lot of the infrastructure part of, uh, of, of on the cryostat and, and the receiver. And once, once it's post this uh, pre-shipment acceptance, it comes for commissioning, and then you have a final acceptance from the results on Sky. So as I said, experienced people are necessary to do this. You need to have close interactions with the instrument delivering teams. Another thing that we had not realized from the beginning in Apex, we always thought before that the instrument teams or the instruments arriving from the shipment will be opened in the base camp and the instruments verified and then taken to the high site. So we built up a reasonably big electronics lab in the base camp to do this. However, this never happened. In fact, all the teams prefer to bring up the instruments in the boxes to the high site and there open and verify them. So this happened for all the instruments. We even had some very uh, delicate uh, um, uh, repairs being done on some instruments and up at the high site. And as I mentioned, procedures for the crane lifting and activities of the, of the uh, instruments are, are important. And I also read you mentioned the centrifugal forces on, on the instruments. Yeah, the electrical power setup on site. This was a problem, of course, for Apex to get it reliably in the beginning. It was the same thing with Alma, actually. So as I mentioned, free generators for reliable production. Uh, you need to be able to switch over between the generators without power cuts. So you have to have a switchboard to do this. You need a fuel refilling setup that actually then fills up from the, uh, from the big tank in the, in, into the, the tank of the, of the generator. And all these things should be monitored and, and you should actually have control over this. Particularly in the beginning, we had problems during snowstorms with the, with the generators because of course you need a lot of air coming in to cool the, the diesel engine. And the air intakes in the powerhouse basically got clogged up uh, with snow, which made the generator stop. So we solved that by, uh, by heating up the air intakes, but we had uh, several years of problems actually during, during snowstorms. And particularly grounding, the grounding of the whole site, including the ground between generators, between containers, between the telescope, uh, between the microwave holography tower, th this is essential. You don't want anything to happen uh, during lightning strikes and you will have a lot of lightning strikes up there. So this is really, really essential. And finally, yeah, long-term maintenance plans. It's absolutely necessary, of course, to produce these maintenance plans uh, together for the telescope with Vertex, uh, for the instruments with the instrument developers and for the infrastructure. Basically, the team have to have to see from uh, what's needed for, for all of the in infrastructure items. And this is essential. Also, spare parts, of course, is, is essential. So there one have to make a plan for which spare parts to, to buy and, and have, have ready in case, in case something happens. Last but not least, logistics. I, it's probably very different between Yama and, uh, and Apex. But anyway, shipment of equipment, that's something that uh, uh, where one can have all kinds of events happening that delays it. Food and lodging, it's important, of course, for staff and everybody. Uh, fuel and fuel deliveries. Now you're in San Antonio Los Cobres, so I guess that should not be a problem. And then commuting, I mean commuting to and from the site to wherever people live and how that is done and so on. It's more of a staff issue than, uh, than anything else, but uh, I'm just mentioning this. It just has to be sorted out. And I think with that, I am finished. Yes. Thank you. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias entonces, eh, Lars, yeah, por, gracias. Por, por su charla. Eh, pasamos entonces ahora a la siguiente charla de, de esta sesión, que será dada por eh, Pedro Bonetti Baclini. Eh, a modo de introducción, puedo decir que Pedro obtuvo su título de grado de, eh, en física en la Universidad Federal, Federal de Paraná en 2005 y su maestría en astrofísica en la Universidad de Sao Paulo, en la USPI, como le dicen por allí, y posteriormente su doctorado en astrofísica también en la USPI, en, en 2012. Eh, después de su doctorado comenzó a participar eh, como postdoctorando en el proyecto Llama, asimismo en otros dos postdoctorados eh, en, en, en IRAM, eh, 
en 2013, de 2013 a 2014 y de 2015 a 2016. Actualmente, desde marzo de, 2020, de, de este año, se, eh, hasta la fecha, se encuentra trabajando en el National Radio Astronomy Observatory, en el NRAO, como miembro del equipo de soporte, eh, como equipo de apoyo de, del BLA, en Socorro, Nuevo, Nuevo México. Eh, en lo respectivo a su área de investigación, hay diversos temas dentro de la radioastronomía, como los cuásares, los másares, eh, la astroquímica y, bueno, también la instrumentación. En su charla de hoy, Pedro nos va a hablar de eh, el monitoreo de la variabilidad de blasters a longitudes de onda milimétricas y submilimétricas. Así que, eh, Pedro, cuando, cuando quieras, la pantalla es tuya. Bueno, me están mirando todos y gracias por la presentación. Y bueno, voy a ponerme para no perder la hora. Gracias, por la presentación. Y lo primero, me gustaría de empezar eh, dando mis sentimientos a toda la comunidad. Y como Nicolás ya habló, y Zulema y, y Jacques, es una pérdida sentida por todos, la pérdida de Cristina. ¿sí? Y bueno, y me gustaría también de agradecer por la invitación de, de la equipe de JAMA para poder hablar un poco del trabajo que yo he hecho durante muchos años en la Universidad de São Paulo, que es el monitoramiento de Blazar. Eh, en onda de radio, en complementos de onda milimétricos, y voy a hablar un poco de los complementos de onda submilimétricos, un trabajo que yo he hecho con Tani y Zulema, que vosotros conocen, y también con, con, con Juliana. Eh, normalmente, cuando yo empiezo a hablar de mis resultados eh, en el, el observatorio de Itapequinga, ¿no? que ahora se llama Pierre Kaufman, yo pongo esta charla con el título de, de monitorando los blazares utilizando instrumentos brasileños, porque lo utilizamos dos observatorios, utilizamos el observatorio Pierre Kaufman, que entonces se llamaba observatorio de Tapetinga, y también utilizamos el observatorio Pico dos Días para hacer medidas ópticas polarimétricas. Y estoy muy seguro que espero que en poco tiempo yo pueda cambiar el nombre de la charla para decir que el monitoramiento de blazar en instrumentos brasileños y argentinos con los dados de llama que espero que lleguen en poco tiempo a aniversario. ¿vale? Bueno, yo estoy cierto que la mayoría de vosotros lo saben bien, lo que es, lo que es los blasares, ¿sí? son núcleos de activos de galaxia, y yo gustaría de simplemente de enfatizar dos características, que son fuentes muy variables, y lo sabemos eso hace mucho tiempo, son fuentes variables en diferentes escalas de tiempo, y que la principal característica es que el que chato está apuntando en nuestra dirección, entonces estamos mirando exactamente de dentro del chat. ¿Sí? Bueno, por eso, al hacer eso, ¿sí? como tenemos en esa figura esquemática, creo que pueden mirar mi mouse así, nosotros estamos mirando hacia acá. ¿Vale? Y eso hace que los blasares sean importantes fuentes para estudiar la relatividad de los fenómenos envolvidos de la, de, de la, de, de la física relativística. ¿Sí? Es un importante laboratorio para eso, no podemos perder ese mente nunca. Entre los fenómenos relativísticos que muy, muy, muy conocidos que, que envuelven la física de los blasares, ¿sí? está el beaming effect, ¿sí? el efecto beaming, que es cuando la radiación es ampliada en la dirección del movimiento del propagador. Entonces, si algo está propagando en velocidad relativística en nuestra dirección, nós vamos a mirar la radiación ampliada, que no es una emisión intrínseca, pero simplemente eh, es el efecto de la relatividad por este factor Doppler, es el efecto Doppler relativístico. ¿sí? ¿Sí? Y eso contribuye de algún modo de la alta variabilidad que tienen estas fuentes. ¿sí? Por supuesto que el próximo efecto, todos vosotros ya, ya oíram hablar alguna vez, que es la velocidad subnominal, que es el movimiento eh, de, de los componentes, se parece aparente arriba de la luz, más rápido que la luz, eh, con, cuando miramos con, con fenómenos con, con imagen de VLBI, pero eso también es un efecto de la relatividad. Lo que quizás a la mayoría de vosotros lo saben o poco conocen, ¿sí? es que en los últimos 20 años ¿sí? se ha identificado una relación muy buena entre la, la ejerción de componentes en el chato con los flares en raíz gamma. Entonces hay una buena correlación entre el flare en gamma y la ejerción de estos componentes supernominales. Bueno, la curva de luz de 373, un quasar que más tarde fue identificado como también teniendo un fenómeno blasar, ¿sí? Es muy variable y es muy observada en los últimos 50 años. Esta es la curva de luz histórica, de histórico porque bueno, tiene 50 años 
que é tipo de diversas autores, é compilada por Soud em 2012, sim? em 37 GHz. E que me gostaria de chamar a atenção de vocês é que há momentos de muito baixa atividade. Há momentos, mire, isso é quase dois, três anos, em que a fonte não passa de 12, 13 janskis, e há outros momentos, e durante dois, três anos, que a fonte se queda arriba de 50 janskis. Então, são fontes muito variáveis, são fontes que cambiam muito sua densidade de fluxo. E o que sabemos quando ingressamos para compreender a fase quiet e a fase ativa é que, pelo menos durante a fase ativa, sí, há retrasos entre os distintos comprimentos de onda. Sí. E a primeira vez que isso foi visto foi visto em infrarrojo nos anos 80, sí, quando um flare, quando o aumento da densidade de fluxo infrarrojo foi detectada mais de seis meses depois em ondas de rádio. Então, nós sabemos que há ao menos na fase ativa, quizás também na fase ocaite, para por suposto na fase ativa, sim, um retraso de meses entre os flares, entre os distintos comprimentos de onda. E por que é o atraso? Bueno, o modelo que melhor explica os atrasos é o modelo de choque em chato, que ha sido desarrollado en los años 80, pero bueno, ha sido modernizado y hay otras versiones, pero la idea principal es que tú tienes una gestión de una componente pequeña, opaca, así que va se expandiendo. Y cuando se expande, se torna transparente, inundado con primero de onda, y en este momento en que miramos el flare en este comprimento de onda. Entonces, en pieza chica, tú tienes el flare en rayos gamma, después el flare en X-ray, después el flare en óptico infrarrojo, y después cuando está mayor, se queda transparente em onda de rádio, e nós vemos o flare em ondas de rádio. Acá, isso, isso pode tardar semanas e até meses. Então, a escala de tempo típica, que pode cambiar de dois até oito, nove meses, é meses para chegar das altas, altas energias até o rádio. E de alguns dias, se compararmos gama até a óptica. Bom, acá há um, um, um esquema, uma figura um pouco mais moderna, mostrando os diferentes pontos de, 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 de flares em las diferentes frequências conforme a componente se expande. Bueno. E aí podem perguntar, pelo Pedro, mire, já temos 50 anos de dados de 373, mais 35 anos de dados de 379, e por que temos que continuar mirando? Bueno, a primeira coisa que eu contesto é que temos que continuar os estudos de variabilidade porque não compreendemos tudo. E isso, por si só, já basta para que continuemos buscando mais resposta virando lá na variabilidade. Mas também, os estudos de variabilidade nessas fontes começaram em muitos sítios do, do mundo, porque em 2008 entrou em operação o satélite espacial FERM, que começou a fornecer variabilidade em raios gama para essas fontes. Então, em la curva de luz histórica, em los anos do século XX, nós temos a variabilidade em rádio, mas não temos como correlacionar com o gama, porque não havia instrumentos fazendo monitoramento contínuo. Sí. E por agora, a partir de 2008, temos a informação em gama, e por isso, muitos grupos ao mundo começaram a monitorar essas fontes de novo, mais frequentemente, para comparar com a curva de luz de Fermi. E aí, agora, vai falar de nossas observações. Antes de falar exatamente de nossos dados, vale passar um overview de las muitas campanhas que se surgiram com o objetivo de monitorar estas fontes. ¿sí? Então, temos o grupo de suporte de Fermi, Galas Agile, F-Gamma, Ovro, também é feito o seu monitoramento, e também monitoramentos interferométricos de la Boston University e o que mire como essas fontes estão evoluindo e comparando com a curva de luz de gama que começamos a atender desde 2008. Bueno, essa é a nossa lista de fontes. Sí. Eh, mire que entre alguns quasares que han identificado o fenômeno do Blasá, também podemos acá o centro galáctico, que por supuesto não é o Blasá, mas estávamos entre as fontes que estavam monitorando também. Eu vou falar nesta charla o resultado dessas três fontes, que são fontes muito conhecidas da rádio astronomia: 3273, 3279 e 1510089. Sí. Esse é o monitoramento nós outros hicimos en el observatorio de Itapetinga, entonces se llamaba observatorio de Itapetinga, hoy es el conocido radio observatorio Pierre Kaufmann, hicimos medidas mensales, ¿sí? de, de, durante cuatro años para 3279 y 3273, durante dos años para 150089. Eh, es una medida single dish, entonces el bin size es muy grande, es de 2.4 arco minutos, es decir, que nosotros detectamos toda la emisión de la componente, las fuentes son puntuales, y detectamos toda la emisión de los chatos integrados. Este es el observatorio de Tapetinga, acá soy yo, 
durante mais né, de testes, então, esse período, e acá, é a troca do é câmbio da redoma, que foi feito antes de eu chegar é, a, a, a sala observatória. Né, observatória. Bueno, é, os dados polarimétricos foram, foram obtidos em, em observatório pico dois dias, sim, entre 15 a 10 a 0,89, é, entre 2, 4 anos para 15 a 10 0,89, e 3 a 0,79, nós também temos 3 a 0,73, utilizamos o IAGPO, sim, e utilizamos o package PCCDPEC de ORF, desenrolado por Pereira. Então, se já sido observação simultânea, já me quedava em Tapetinga, e Tânia se quedava em, em um pico dos dias, observando ao mesmo tempo as mesmas fontes. Então, se são exatamente simultâneas. E aqui é uma medida de, 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 de operar. Na foto do PD. Bueno, falando dos resultados. Para a DRC273, sí, nós detectamos um flare em ondas de rádio com retraso de seis meses de um flare observado primeiramente em gama. Sí. Temos aqui eh, eh, em, em, a emissão gama e no axis abaixo e à direita. Sí. Temos o rádio top e esquerda. Sí. E o, 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 o aumento em gama foi detectado em setembro de 2009. Enquanto em onda de rádio, em março de 2010, com seis meses de retraso. O que é interessante desse flare que detectamos o retraso sim, é que este aumento, bueno, antes de dizer isso, dizer que isso foi confirmado com método estatístico, utilizamos a BCF e detectamos aqui um atraso de 150 dias, mais ou menos 20 dias, mais ou menos 15 dias, sim, para confirmar. Esta, esta correlação entre dois comprimentos de onda. Bueno, é, uma coisa interessante deste aumento em razão gama é que este aumento de emissão havia sido previsto por um modelo de precessão desenvolvido por Zuleme e Gustavo, dois astrônomos que vós outros todos conhecem muito bem. Sim. E em Los Angeles 90, eles detectaram, perceberam uma variação sistemática de la velocidade das componentes superluminais juntamente com o ângulo de posição. Sim. E interpretaram isso como um movimento de precessão do chato. Qual é a ideia? Se o chato está precessionando, com o momento que está mais perto de nós, o fator Doppler vai ser maior. E se miramos aquela equação de Lorentzen, que já expliquei o princípio do aumento da densidade de fluxo, sim, nós vemos que depende do fator delta. E neste momento, os flares, se tiver um flare, vai ser muito mais brilhante, porque este fator vai ser mais importante em la emissão. Se mire com cuidado, se a curva de luz em gama, o flare em gama, é muito mais brilhante que o flare em onda de rádio. Bueno, se mire, a, 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 a average de o flare em gama está em torno de 1, mais ou menos 6, o flare estuda em 5, é quase 5 vezes mais, mais que a fase quiet, enquanto em rádio se amplia de uma média de 23 para 35, 37 Jonskis, é menos que 50%. O aumento em rádio é 50%, o aumento em gama é 5 vezes mais. Sim. Isso também pode ser, isso está compatível com a ideia de precessão do chato, porque esse termo aqui é o índice, é, é, esse termo duplo depende do fator P, que é 2 para os jatos de GN, e do índice espectral. É um índice espectral de rádio, é menos 2, cerca de menos 2, sim. esse termo praticamente se anula, enquanto para a gama, sim, esse, esse termo é alfa é menos 0.7, esse termo é muito mais significante para a emissão gama. Então, se em um momento que o jato está mais cerca da linha aniversada, temos um flare, sim. Lo vamos ver muito mais intensos em ondas de gama do que em de rádio. Então, isso está compatível com o esperado, o que previsto por Zulene Gustavo em, em 99, nos anos 90. Sim. Mas, bom, bueno, uh, uh, tive, de facto, uma ejeção em um flare e no momento que o jato estava próximo. Quando miramos uh, os dados de Velibar de Jursa, uh, há detectado uma emissão de quatro componentes neste mês, que foram as correspondentes de Leo Flare em raios gama. E alguns podem pensar, bom, bueno, é um pouco de sorte, sim, no exato momento em que o flare, em que o chato está apontado para nós, temos a gestão de quatro componentes. Bom, bueno, não é sorte, não é sorte na ciência, sim. O que passa é que a relação de temporal entre a fonte e, o, e, e a Terra e o observatório também se cambia mientras o chato está precessionando. Assim como se cambia o fator duplo, a relação de tempo entre, entre a fonte e o e o observador também se cambia conforme o jato se precessiona. Então, nós dissemos o seguinte, 
hemos suponido que la tasa de ejección de componentes, o el rate de ejección de componentes, pues, fuera constante en el referencial de la fuente y tentamos eh, eh, medir si la variación que vimos, ahora vemos más componentes menos, es simplemente consecuencia del cambio eh, de tiempo, de escala de tiempo de la fuente y la, 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 el observador por conta del movimiento del objeto. ¿sí? Tenemos acá la línea preta, es una tarra constante, no variación en la referencia de la fuente, la línea puntillada con puntos acá que miramos es simplemente lo correspondiente a una pequeña variación no más de 20%, bueno, que también es esperado, ¿sí? Y esta curva acá es que le esperamos de cambio de la contracción temporal durante el movimiento de la chapa. Entonces, debemos ver que en el momento más próximo, sí, eso puede explicar por qué tenemos esa ejección de componentes, de muchos componentes, justamente cuando el chapa está apuntado para nosotros. Bueno, hablando de la segunda fuente de 3 de 79, puede mirar ahora muchas curvas de luz. Sí, nuestros datos de Akibaya, eh, de Pierre Ricoff, un observatorio, está acá, arriba, cuando miramos este aumento. Acá abajo en las líneas, tenemos la medida de densidad de flujo del núcleo, eh, medida por el Boston University Group, utilizando el LVI. Entonces, mire que en cuanto medimos un aumento, el núcleo no está brillante, es decir, que este aumento viene de la otra parte del chato. Recuerda que estamos mirando todo integrado. Acá abajo tenemos imágenes ópticas del programa SMART de monitoramiento, uno de los muchos programas que ingresaron junto con FEM, ¿sí? donde mede la variabilidad de flujo en la banda R. ¿sí? Y acá tenemos los datos en gama y abajo nuestras medidas polarimétricas. Note que tenemos un aumento en onda de radio que se empezó meses después, más una vez, del aumento de la curva de luz óptica. Si miramos los datos en gama, por supuesto, no hay como hay entre CD73 un muy lindo y claro flare que pudimos identificar. Hay un intenso flickering, pero si mire con cuidado, hay acá un aumento en alta gama que puede ser la contrapartida en altas energías de este aumento que tuve eh, 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 en el óptico cerca de 20 días después, pero este aumento que tuve en una de high meses después. ¿sí? Pero una cosa es muy clara. El padrón de variabilidad óptica y el padrón de variabilidad de radio siguen el mismo comportamiento, son idénticos, pero con retraso de cinco meses. Si mire acá, ese es el punto de radio, arriba y la izquierda, y acá a la derecha y abajo, los puntos ópticos están retrasados de cinco meses y se si mire, es un comportamiento de variabilidad muy parecido para las dos curvas de luz. Cuando hicimos la DCF, bueno, más una vez está acá el pico, cerca de 150 a 160 días, confirmando esta atrás estadísticamente, pero con gama, tampoco en radio gama o en óptico gama, vimos algún atraso claro y nuestra interpretación es que ese flickering que hay entre el CD79, que no hay entre el CD73, ha dificultado una detección de, de un retraso. Bueno. Hablando de 15 a 10, 0, 89, más una vez el mismo plot, mire que es interesante que que en ondas de radio hemos visto un aumento y tú puedes reparar que en el núcleo de lo, de lo VLBI, si sí, el aumento se saca, interpretamos que simplemente la emisión está en la componente que fue injetada en el núcleo. ¿sí? Entonces acá tenemos un aumento gradativo de la onda de radio. ¿sí? En óptico, el programa SMART, hay dos gaps que se queda muy difícil de identificar si tuve o si no tuve un flare en este complemento de onda. Pero cuando miramos en rayos gamma, veremos sucesivos flares. Este es un caso muy interesante porque, más una vez, vemos como el fenómeno de shock en shock puede expresar de diferentes formas en las, en las fuentes, ¿sí? en las distintas fuentes. ¿sí? Si tú mires la, 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 la secuencia de flares y, y no tenemos una clara contrapartida y sin un aumento gradativo en radio, lo interpretamos sí, que tiene el primer flare en, en, en y onda de radio, el primer flare en raíz gamma, tú miras que la escala de variabilidad por la fuente ser más chiquita es más curta. Entonces tú miras toda la subida y decréscimo de flare, y este flare se va a quedar brillante en radio meses después. Pero si luego siguiente la primera componente, hay una segunda componente, ¿sí? nosotros también vamos a ver con la componente chiquita la, el decréscimo de decréscimo de densidad de flujo. El punto es. Cuando esta segunda componente empieza a ampliar su flujo en ondas de radio, la primera componente todavía está muy brillante en radio. Y lo que vamos a ver en radio es una superposición. Entonces, tenemos tres o cuatro componentes mirando acá, tendremos cuatro flares mirando acá, ¿sí? 
e um aumento gradativo sí, nesta emissão em, em ondas de rádio, porque estamos mirando a composição. Então, é importante notar que a dificuldade é que a escala de variabilidade também é distinta. Em gama, é de alguns dias, em rádio, dura mais tempo. É difícil identificar um retraso entre os dois comprimentos de onda, porque tu tem um aumento único em sucessivos flares. Mas se mira o primeiro flare, foi todo um período em que a emissão de ondas de rádio não estava brilhante. Podemos identificar 1, 2, 3, 4 com 1, 2, 3, 4 pontos e tentar estimar retraso simplesmente pela ordem desses pontos e estimamos um retraso de 55 dias. Bueno, para terminar um pouco das duas fontes, eu vou falar da parte rádio. Permita-me falar um pouco da polarimetria óptica. Sim. Note que neste momento em que teve o flare gama para 3,279, hemos visto um aumento no ângulo de, 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 de grau de polarização e uma rotação de ângulo de polarização. Isso foi visto em 3,279 e também foi visto em 15,10,089. É, mire, agora para o ano de 2009, não temos dados em rádio acá, sim, mas temos uma informação muito interessante que teve uma atividade gama, não tão brilhante quanto esta, mas todavía é intensa, sim e que, ao mesmo tempo, detectamos uma variabilidade muito grande em no ângulo de, de polarização e uma rotação deste, no grau, de grado de polarização e no ângulo de polarização. Se miramos com mais detalhes, sí, temos dados exatamente no momento que empieza o flare, sí, e em um intervalo de dois dias, coincidente com o flare em gama, tivemos uma rotação de ângulo de polarização sí, de cerca de 70 graus. 70 graus, um pouco mais de 70, caso 80 graus. Sim. Nós outros interpretamos isso como se tu tem um chato, e nesse chato todas as componentes são mais ou menos de mesma intensidade, podemos descrever sua polarização simplesmente com os parâmetros de Stokes do chato. Mas se neste momento surge uma nova componente, essa nova componente é muito brilhante, sim, podemos tratar que houve uma soma dos parâmetros de Stokes do chato com esta nova componente, e isso me temos o câmbio de um ângulo de polarização de muitos graus em simplesmente um intervalo de dois dias, como vimos aqui de 20 para 22 de abril, porque essa nova componente que obtivemos, na verdade, passa a ser a soma dos parâmetros de estudos. Já, bueno, meu tempo está se terminando, estou ao fim. Me gostaria simplesmente de falar um pouquinho de como o JAMA pode ser importante para nosso estudo, para nosso monitoramento. Sim. É, no, eu vou mostrar aqui muitas das contrapartidas milimétricas com os raios de JAMA mas seria muito interessante mirar este comportamento na parte submilimétrica do espectro, mirar os retraços entre os diferentes comprimentos de onda da parte submilimétrica e também comparar com os outros, como óptica e gama. Sí. O que necessito chamar um pouco a atenção é que há pouco, muito poucos dados de variabilidade em submilimétricos, mientras em centímetros e milimétricos há muito mais surface de variabilidade. Um dos poucos dados foram medidos muito interessantes programas em era CEST, sim, sí. É, é, pero todavía no teníamos informaciones en gama, entonces no sabemos muy bien cómo va a ser. Yo recuerdo que gama va a poder operar en dos bandas simultáneas, entonces podemos observar al menos dos o cuatro, dos casas simultáneas y dos exactamente simultáneas entre ellas, cómo funciona, é, é, cómo un flare puede se propagar en, la diferente, en las diferentes fuentes de gama. ¿sí? Por tanto, es posible la sin gama, estas fuentes son fuentes muy brillantes, cerca de 100 junks, em um rango submilimétrico, quer dizer que podemos observá-las em um tempo muito, muito curto. Em cerca de poucos minutos, podemos ter sinal suficiente para ser uma medida, sim? e podemos fazer isso dois, três, quatro vezes no mês, dependendo do tempo. É, quizás, temos um programa de, de large survey utilizando é, é, JAMA para monitorar diferentes dessas fontes, esta escala. O que esperamos ver é mais ou menos isso aqui, um pico em, grandes, em frequências mais altas, e um flare que vai ser identificado pelas frequências mais baixas, cambiando também seu su, su, su ancho. Vale? Bueno, eu espero, nesses 23 minutos, abrir um pouco mais do que estava previsto, sí? mas espero ter convencido vos outros sí? que monitorar as áreas é muito importante para compreender a física dos agentes, que não é necessário simplesmente que não simplesmente observações simultâneas, temos que ter campanhas simultâneas de monitoramento, monitorar com muitos, com muitos observatórios ao mesmo tempo para mirar o comportamento dos flares em distintos comprimentos de onda. E se não isso, podemos descobrir coisas e, 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 e estudar como laboratório de relatividade essas fontes de um modo incrível, como eu já mostrado para vocês. E 
Aí, poucos dados de variabilidade de submilimétricos. Então, vocês já vai ser uma, ferra, uma ferramenta muito importante para o estudo dessas fontes. Se é interessado, se quer é, participar da colaboração, se quer se tem dúvidas, é, esse, esse é meu e-mail. Sim. E, bueno, eu termino por aqui. Bueno, gracias Pedro. Bien, eh, pasamos entonces a la próxima charla de la sesión de hoy, que va a estar dada por eh, Isabel Alemán. Eh, bueno, Isabel eh, obtuvo su título de grado en física y posteriormente su doctorado en astrofísica en la UPI, en la Universidad de Sao Paulo. Eh, después ha tenido posiciones diversas en Holanda, en la Universidad de Leiden, en, en el Reino Unido, en la Universidad de Manchester. Después, eh, finalmente, en la Universidad de Sao Paulo. Actualmente se encuentra desempeñándose en el Laboratorio de Astrofísica Computacional de la Universidad Federal de eh, Itajubá. Es actualmente miembro del Comité Organizador de la Comisión H3 de Nebulosas Planetarias de la, de la IAU. Eh, su área de expertise, fundamentalmente, es la astrofísica y la astroquímica de nebulosas, eh, PDRs, modelados de fotoionización, nebulosas planetarias y, bueno, por supuesto, galaxias activas, ajenas. Bueno, tiene eh, trabajos muy destacados, como por ejemplo... Eh, Descubrimiento de láser de hidrógeno en nebulosas planetarias, usando datos de Herschel. Descubrimiento de moléculas eh, de, de oxidrilo en nebulosas planetarias, que es un indicador de la formación de agua. Y, y, y muchos otros trabajos muy, muy, muy interesantes. En la charla de hoy, Isabel nos va a contar eh, de moléculas en nebulosas planetarias, eh, la química en ambientes hostiles y cómo llama puede contribuir a este tipo de estudios que, que ella está haciendo. Así que, eh, Isabel, cuando estés listo. Okay, I'm going to, to speak in English because my Spanish Perfect. is not, uh, I'm not very confident with my Spanish here. But anyway, you okay. can uh, ask me questions question in whatever language uh, you prefer, Spanish, Portuguese, or English. Um, so hello to everyone. Uh, first, I'm glad to thank you, Tanya and Nicolas, for the invitation to give this talk. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Isabel Aleman, and this talk is about molecular uh, molecules in uh, planetary nebulae. Yama and the chemistry in harsh environments. So they can, well, it's not changing, sorry, it's not changing the, I don't know why we tested it before. Okay, that's good. Uh, so the goal of this talk uh, is um, maybe what uh, Tonya asked me to do, uh, which was to talk about the impact of Yama in the studies that I do uh, in astrochemistry in planetary nebulae. Uh, maybe uh, this can be extended, of course, everything that I am talking here about planetary nebula can be extended to other harsh environments. And I'm going to explain better about what I mean by harsh environments, but basically is other objects that also has, um, that also have um, a very intense source of radiation close by. And I have to do this in 20 minutes. And I know that everybody here is already uh, a bit tired. So I'm going to give a very, a very general and very light talk, not many, no, not, not with plots and complicated stuff, but just a general talk uh, for you to understand uh, the, the kind of um, need we have uh, in terms of data, uh, in terms of science in this field, and especially what Yama can do. Okay. I don't know if you can see me. Are, are you seeing me as well? Or oh, you hear me fine, okay? Yes, yes. Is it? Okay. Thank you. So the content briefly is, uh, I'm just uh, giving a brief introduction uh, for context. Probably you already know most of the things, but it's just to, to give a little bit of a, um, a scenario of all these things. I'm going to talk about open questions, uh, what has been done, just a summary of the things. And I'm going to talk a little bit more of a few examples uh, and also um, my conclusions of what we still need and how Yama can help with that. So basically, uh, yeah, this has been mentioned before, but molecules are very important, of course. They are seen everywhere, and they are important, of course, for many fields in terms of chemistry, astrobiology, physical conditions of many objects, uh, elemental abundances, when you, uh, you are talking about more dense and molecular environments, um, of course, about evolution of the objects, morphology, and other uh, physics and anything that you can think about it. So you you, um, you have a, a big impact in many fields. Uh, more than two, 200 molecules have been detected in space already, including planetary nebulae. 
Uh, this is a very simple well, this is a, a table with um, the molecules detected in the ISM. Um, also the circumstellar environments, but here is the, it's a little bit cut. I'm going to show a, a full table later. Uh, so why planetary nebula? If it's, you are talking mostly of ionized gas, uh, why to study the molecules there? First, because not all the gas is ionized. Of course, um, uh, let me uh, go back a little bit. But uh, for you that are not familiar with planetary nebulae, these are the ionized ejecta of old, low, and intermediate mass stars. Uh, they have a simple structure into first order. What I mean by that is at the end of this, uh, this star uh, life, uh, this kind of low mass star, um, you end up with a, a ionizing source at the center and gas surrounding. Uh, and this is a simple ge geometry, even though sometimes you have binaries at the center, uh, you mean that you have a very uh, compact source uh, at the center and a gas in an extended um, distribution surrounding. So these are, can be great laboratories for many things, um, for, for us to model and to observe as well. Okay, uh, The importance, of course, uh, is great. Uh, you can study star evolution, you can study uh, ISM enrichment, astrochemistry, many things, and you also have, can have impact in several fields. Uh, I was talking about uh, what I can say uh, in it, extending this kind of study of planetary nebulae. Uh, you can also obtain for me important information from for what we can do uh, in terms of activity, uh, the, the same similar studies inactivity at galactic nuclei, H2 regions, supernova, all these objects, they have very powerful sources at the center. And although, for example, H2 regions are, can be much more complicated with stars distributed all around, and the stellar field is not very easily um, modeled, for example, uh, we can extend things in the simple environment of planetary nebula, where you have the central source uh, and, uh, well, uh, a more uh, a simpler structure, uh, and of course, this uh, is going to, to to be very important in all this uh, for all these objects, the studies of all these objects. Uh, another things that make planetary nebula important is that you know quite we know quite well uh, how is the ionizing spectrum. Uh, this is just a, a small example. We know um, we have very good studies of how these kind of stars evolve during the PNA, the PNA phase. Uh, and we can see that you have a wide range of uh, very high effective temperature. So you can, we can study, study very different spectra in terms of what kind of photons you have. You have more photon ionizing photons, you have less photonizing uh, photons. Um, Again, why study molecules in this in this kind of environments? And do, do we still do, do we actually have molecules there? We, we do. I'm going to talk more and more in more details briefly. Uh, and uh, but the important thing here is that uh, in addition to the ionizing environments that you have surrounding uh, the star, you may have mass enough to have more neutral zones surrounding the object. And this kind of uh, large optical depth environments where the uh, photons um, that ionize uh, hydrogen are, have been, sorry, someone is asking something. Um, where these kind of photons have been already absorbed. So you have uh, mostly uh, here I can show, uh, I'm showing the, the, the transportation of radiation through the, the cloud. And most of these, the, the ionizing photons are absorbed when we go to the PTR, the photon is a, the photo dissociation region. Uh, but then you have photons that can um, actually be very important for the chemistry. And this has been shown both observationally and uh, with models. Uh, a similar thing we can have, for example, um, well, when we are talking about far ultra, ultraviolet, we are mostly talking about stars. Uh, but we can have similar things in terms of our agents or you have X-rays as well. So X-rays can also uh, produce a very rich chemistry that have been 
studying in HNs and other kind of objects. But in planetary nebulae, especially the ones that we have uh, very high uh, central star temperatures, you can have a significant flux of uh, X-rays in the center. Uh, I'm, I thought about um, I talk about this uh, surrounding environment, but this surrounding environment is not uh, uniform. So um, usually you have dense clumps where these uh, molecules can be formed or can survive. This is still in discussion uh, up to today. Uh, but basically, for example, in this helix nebula, you have these what we call cometary knots, which are dense clumps basically. And you can see molecules that are concentrated uh, here. I show CO. This is molecular hydrogen. And this is H alpha, for example, for you to compare how is the emission uh, in this kind of clump. So most of the emission in the helix, for example, the molecular hydrogen emission in the helix is coming from this kind of uh, substructure. So what are the open questions in the field? What we, we, we still don't understand completely. Um, first, in terms of observations, in fact, um, few objects have been actually searched. I mean, most of the observations are done um, from specific objects that are very bright and you can observe very well. And they have been observed very well in other uh, wavelengths, so you can have other kind of information. Uh, this is a pity that, uh, that there are not that many observations. Um, mo the molecular inventory as well is not very well known. Uh, mostly because these objects have been observed much better in the infrared uh, and some in UV as well. We have molecular hydrogen absorption in UV. Uh, but then it's more that a discussion that probably more is more from the ISM. Um, but then in the supermillimeter, you don't have that many observations. And also you have observations in very narrow regions, very narrow wavelength ranges. Uh, so you don't have a... Uh, a great amount of uh, studies on, on, on the, the topic. Uh, and this, of course, limited the models uh, and also limited our knowledge of the real... Um, one, one thing that are limiting our, our, our models are the, the lack of knowledge in terms of reaction rates, uh, especially for PN conditions. Mostly we know this kind of data from laboratory and then you know for low temperature, for example or you don't know uh, how, this, uh, how the, the model is going to behave in, a, in terms of distribution of energy of photos that are uh, incident in the, in the cloud. Also, there are very few chemical evolution studies. Uh, and YAMA can do a lot in terms of observations. Uh, we can expand, I'm, I'm going to talk more this in, in the next slides. Uh, but then you can do a lot for in terms of observations, and then you can improve theory as well, and basing uh, based on on this kind of observations. Um, the, now I'm going to talk a little bit of, uh, more about some of these uh, studies that have been done. Uh, but I'm, I'm not talking about specific studies. I'm going to talk more generally. Uh, I have made a database of years of observations, trying to understand what kind of observations we had uh, to, to be able to evaluate what we really need, okay? So basically, we have, we have discovered uh, 65 molecules. And here, uh, an important thing I have to say is that uh, I'm including here not only planetary nebulae, but also preplanetary nebulae. These are the, the, this is the, the, the previous phase in terms of molecular hydrogen. Um, and so in terms of planetary nebula, this is the, the previous phase, uh, because uh, more of some of um, the studies that I want to do is, uh, in fact, to, to study the evolution from the HB phase up to the molecular, uh, up to the, the molecular uh, cloud that can form uh, also uh, surrounding planetary nebula. Uh, sorry, come back. Uh, one thing uh, we have uh, in all my search in the, in the literature, I found 192 uh, planetary nebulae that have been observed and uh, molecules have been detected, in fact. Uh, and only for H5 preplanetary nebulae, I mean, it seems like a, a, a big number, 
uh, of objects. And why, why I, I'd say the opposite before is because most of these objects have been only searched in molecular hydrogen and CO. Um, very few, um, probably around 20 or some, something like it, have been observed, um, have been searched for other molecules. Uh, we have lots of papers published, but usually it's from the same objects over and over. Uh, I'm going to show four objects here in this next slide. And these four objects have been observed many, many times. Every time that a, a person has wants to observe something new, they go and look for these objects because they are bright and easy to observe, of course. Uh, and we know uh, them very well from other studies. But then these have been limiting our knowledge because we don't uh, have uh, information from other objects. And these objects are very weird ones. For example, NGC 7027 is an unusual planetary nebula. It, it shows it's more like, like a PDR, uh, a cloud that's surrounding uh, hydro, um, eight two regions, than exactly a planetary nebula. Although we know for a fact that it's a planetary nebula. The other three objects in this, uh, in this page here are pre-planetary nebula. So most of the time, if a person wants to, to search for molecules, they go for this protoplanetary nebula or pre-planetary nebula. Um, well, these objects are great, but let's try another objects for a change. Uh, for example, recently people have tried to change these objects and tried to search in other objects, and they were very success successfully. Um, successful, sorry, uh, these objects, for example, have been observed by the groups of by the group of Zuris um, that uh, have published a series of papers in the last years uh, about observation with an antenna. Uh, sorry, two antennas that are similar to, one of them is an Alma, kind of Alma antenna, and the other one is a 10, uh, 10 meters diameter dish. And they have been uh, done a very, a very uh, an excellent job searching for new molecules and get some physics from, from these and chemistry as well. So for this particular object, uh, you, you can see that you have lots of mo different molecules and they observe just in two bands if I'm not mistaken here, but I think it's just two bands. Uh, they have, they, they, they got lots of information and they can, could compare to these other traditionally uh, observed um, planetary nebulae. And I mean, uh, they, they are searching for these objects and they, molecules in these objects and they are finding. So we, we have a good chance to, we have a, a good chance to observe in many planetary, in planetary nebulae this kind of, um, molecules as well. Um, the molecular inventory of planetary nebulae is uh, not very uh, well known, as I mentioned before. Uh, in this uh, table here, I'm showing in, well, all the molecules here have been observed or in the ISM or in some kind of circumstellar environment. In blue, I'm showing planetary nebulae and protoplanetary nebulae. Um, the, the molecules that have been observing these uh, objects, but uh, the, the, for planetary nebulae, these these ones that have are circle or in, in this sorry, uh, I put these uh, pink boxes surrounding. Uh, you can see that there are not that many molecules, and if you study in detail the chemistry and you see the discussions in many papers, you see that you observe molecules, and from these molecules that we, we are seeing, we expect uh, based on models of their networks that you sh we should be seeing some, some other molecules that we are actually, uh, that they have not been observed. And we, we don't know exactly why. Um, sometimes we have tried to detect it. Sometimes it's because we didn't try to detect them. But I mean, uh, in planetary nebulae, for example, you see many more molecules than in planetary nebulae. Um, we, we think that probably this is because, of course, the, the, the center we start is getting hotter. So probably you have more ionizing photons and you have a, um, uh, the, the ionization region is expanding, um, entering this uh, and destroying the molecules, in fact. Uh, but also there are models that uh, show that you, you can actually form or at least maintain um, this, this a rich chemistry. I mean, you, you can see, for example, molecules with nine atoms. You can see 
fullerenes with 60 atoms as well. Uh, so where is the, the other chemistry? How, how is this chemistry uh, happening? I mean, it's just a destruction. It's just a photo dissociation uh, problem. Uh, some model says that, that that's not that simple. So probably we have also some other conditions and we are forming different molecules. We, we don't see exactly the same um, behavior um, in, um, in terms of evolution of molecules that, that, that we, we would expect if it, is, if it was only destruction. Um, one thing that we can also study, that's one of my interests, is, is to study the evolution of this chemistry. As I mentioned before, we don't understand from protoplanetary and uh, up to the, the phase of planetary nebulae, but also we don't know uh, from AGBs to protoplanetary to PN, uh, what, which is the evolution. Um, we can see from this, uh, this table that probably you have lots of uh, destruction going in, going around, but also part of these uh, more, the, the molecules that we, we part of the, the, the thing that, that the fact that we are seeing more molecules in AGP is because they are bright and well, um, more dense and uh, it is an observation thing. Uh, you are seeing an environment that's, um, that has a higher uh, surface brightness. That, that's my, that was my point. Another thing that we don't understand very well still, we, we know uh, for simple molecules that we have uh, this um, dependence from uh, be between molecules, the presence of models and the effective temperature. And if we think about destruction, this is exactly what we will not expect. So when we model, um, we can sh the, the, the molecular emission and the molecular uh, densities, we can show that for some molecules, we are going to see more emission and more molecules if you have higher effective temperature. And this is because uh, mainly these kind of objects, they can form a larger PDRs or large uh, XDRs, if you, if you think so. Um, and then we can have more emission. Okay. Uh, but this is not uh, the, the whole picture. We still don't uh, understand. We, do, we, don't, we cannot reproduce this very well with the models yet. Uh, for molecular hydrogen, this is, this is okay. But for some of the ions, we, we cannot understand how the, why, why this is happening. Uh, also, we have, for example, other kind of dependence for fluoridines, for example. Uh, we see more, more this, of these kind of molecules in, in planetary nebulae that have a low effective temperature, uh, central stars. We don't understand that either. So we have many um, data, many works in terms of um, uh, from the infrared, from models, uh, from models both from molecular hydrogen and some simple molecules as well. Uh, but they, although they show this dependence, uh, this is not clear yet for what's going to happen for the other ions. So we, we still have uh, work to do. Um, let me just summarize from the uh, database that I prepared a couple of years ago. Uh, I could see exactly the fraction of planetary nebulae with, uh, uh, as a function of the, the central star temperature. Uh, I showed this in this plot. So basically we see more planetary nebulae with molecular um, detections than uh, for, sorry, for planetary nebulae that has high uh, effective temperature than for planetary nebulae with low effective temperature. So what we can do with Yama? Of course, we have we can observe more objects as we this is always our goal. Uh, but this is particularly important because in planetary nebulae, in, in this problem in particular, because few objects have been actually searched. And increasing the, the number of objects observation, obser oh, sorry, observed, uh, also means that we have a larger pool of characteristics and we can better understand um, how. Uh, the chemistry is, is happening and how the physics is affecting the molecules. Uh, and then, uh, of course, getting better, stati better statistics and understand the physics. Um, also, Ulyama can help uh, increasing the molecular inventory. We are not only, we cannot only observe more planetary nebulae, but we can observe in other windows 
the, the same planetary nebula that have been observed, for example, for molecular hydrogen or CO, uh, but we don't have uh, other information or other molecules that, uh, that, that may be present in this planetary nebula. So new wavelength ranges uh, can uh, um, uh, improve the number of uh, molecular detections. Also, one thing that is important is to better systematic search for these species. The, the observations have been um, sparse and not very well coordinated. Uh, so probably we usually have many uh, different uh, observatories observing the same molecules or uh, the same objects, and we don't. Uh, we, we should do a better systematic search for these species in different objects. Um, and it, this is, of course, is going to expand the, the inventory. Uh, the ideal case for me is uh, to make a systematic survey uh, with more planetary nebula being observed in the submillimeter and millimeter ranges and looking for more molecules so it can have a better view of all the, the this inventory and also in terms of the, the pool of characteristics of these objects and then can have better models um, accompanying this, uh, this kind of observations. I think that is the, 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 really the ideal case. And I think Lyama can do that. With Lyama, we can do that. We are going to have access uh, to, to a close by observatory. We can have access to time. Uh, and this is going to be important. So this is what I was planning to say. I hope I have been clear enough. Uh, and I can, I've convinced it to you that uh, this is something that's important to be observed. So have questions, I'm glad to. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Isabel, for such a beautiful talk. Uh, bien, bueno, hemos terminado entonces la sesión eh, del día de hoy. Eh, les agradecemos a todos por su participación y a los disertantes por sus lindas charlas. Y los esperamos para la próxima edición de este ciclo de de este ciclo de seminarios y bueno, gracias a todos y a todas por, por estar hoy allí presentes. Nos despedimos.